coming in on the plane, I had the, the idea that I might want to change the title of this talk. I haven't changed the title. There are two reasons to change the title. One is what I want to give to you this morning uh, in my first hour, and my only hour, is uh, a ruler by which you can decide whether or not something that claims to be science is science. A ruler to decide what the quality of that science is. And I'm going to introduce four terms to you. That's uh, conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law. And I'm going to give you some ways to grade uh, propositions in science, which I call models. And you'll be able to decide for yourself, I hope, using what I'm going to give you, whether or not something, where it stands in that scale of quality. Uh, the other thing is I, I spent a lot of my career working for the University of California at Irvine, UCI, um, working on the uh, Science Education Advisory Board. I was an industry member on that. I was working for Hughes Aircraft Company. And the goal of the, the objective of the uh, Science Education Advisory Board was to try to bring up the level of preparedness of high school graduates so they could get into uh, college level mathematics and physics and chemistry, all the physical sciences. And the students were coming out woefully unprepared. So we ran a program in which we gave uh, certificates to uh, teachers, secondary school teachers, after a three-year program where they came in on the summer and went through our, our training to try to get them up to speed on science. And the, the objective of science and science education is to teach kids to think objectively. We weren't trying to make scientists out of them. Over 80% of the kids that our teachers were going to be uh, instructing would never go to college. They, they most, a good percentage of them would be uh, high school dropouts. But we wanted to teach kids to think objectively and to be skeptical. So what I thought about as a title for this thing is skepticism. And it fits with what I want to teach you this morning and show you this morning. And uh, it fits in a broader scheme of where science is supposed to go. <coughs> I had been working at Hughes Aircraft Company for uh, over 20 years when I got hooked up with uh, UCI. I changed jobs at Hughes and I went from the missile division where I became Dr. Rocket and, and moved down to, uh, to uh, Irvine, California, which was close, obviously close to uh, UCI. And I was immediately uh, assigned to interface with uh, UCI on their science education program. And I've been doing a lot of training, and I brought to that group the, the idea, you can't teach science if you can't define it. And that caused uh, the professors that I was working with a lot of consternation. And uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Mara Tagapara, uh, really a delightful woman who was running the uh, Summer Science Institute, she said the question had come up at a conference in Berkeley, California, University of California, Berkeley. And a bunch of the uh, professors were standing around drinking their drinks in the, in the foyer be between, uh, between lectures. And the same issue came up. And one of them said that science was like love. Um, we can't define it, but we know it when we see it. And so I use that as kind of a theme. And, and I disagree. I disagree. We can define it, and we can define it in a way that, uh, that makes it an operational definition. You can decide whether something is science or not by what I'm going to show you today. So let's get into that. The uh, presenters today will be talking to you about specific scientific models, as in pharmacology, as in cell biology, as in exercise physiology. And what I'm going to give you is an overview. It's kind of a superstructure for science so that these, should, these other topics should fit within what I give you today. Hopefully it will. So I'm giving you a super model of science. Uh, you can't read this. It's an eye test. It's my background. It'll be in the, it'll be in the, uh, the set of, of charts which we're posting on the journal. Be in the test, too. <laughs> yeah, right. Like all my true false questions are my biography. So, uh, 
I don't know if the uh, last lecture ever got posted or not. I've been in touch with Tony and he hasn't answered back whether they ever got posted. But the, these uh, charts are supposed to be posted there too, so you can get a copy there. I take the student teachers on an imaginary trip on a, on a magic flying carpet where we go around the universe and we visit, the, we visit Earth before man was there at all. And I made a list of all the things that you don't see when you're flying around looking at Earth uh, without man's presence. There's no such thing as a coordinate system. There are no such things as, as the parameters of mass and length and time. These are all man's constructs. I derive from all of this that there are no models in nature uh, for science to discover. And you will find in a lot of writings that that's what science is all about, discovery of the laws of nature. And I contend that's not so. What science is is about detecting patterns that are in nature, and then we create the models that, that describe what we have seen. I'm going to be, as the bottom line says on this chart, I'm going to be a bit pedantic <coughs> about uh, the words that I use. And it's a necessity in science that terms be defined very precisely. And by the way, I, I would enjoy interruptions. I don't know what your background is, and I will ask you a question or two as we go through this. But uh, I like a question that says, now, I don't understand a word you used, uh, evolution, or uh, I don't understand a word you used, uh, equilibrium. Those are the kind of questions I'd like to hear. And I can kind of scale what I say to what your background is. I don't particularly want to hear the question, or the response, I don't understand a word you said. I don't understand what pedantic is. <laughs> pedantic. Uh, Teacher-like. OK? This isn't fitting the screen here. Is it, does it show any better? No. Let's see if I can think of it. Uh, can we uh, zoom out yeah, a little bit? Where it says 22 percent, sort of the top of your laptop screen. You change that to like just hundred or something, or right in the middle of the top. Well, this is no apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. What I'm going to talk to you about today. I have adopted words that are very common in the practice of science. Um, I had a job at Hughes to uh, run the internal research and development programs for two of the profit and loss centers. And I would create these programs, I would sell them to the government, because you have to have government sponsorship in order to be an IR&D program. That way you can charge it against contracts as an expense. So I'd run these, I'd create these IR&D programs sometimes, sometimes I'd acquire them from somewhere else, and I would get people out of the company to run the programs. And very often I had to cross-train people, which means that I had to take an engineer and make a basic scientist out of them, and I had to take a basic scientist and make an engineer out of them. So I had to know the difference between the two and teach them to these people, and these were people uh, all with advanced degrees. And so... I got into the, uh, into the problem of defining science before I got associated with UCI. So, um, this is an operative de uh, definition of science. It's, um, it's a way to decide whether something is science, not, what it's, not whether or not there's quality control, um, which I have on the, uh, shown on an arrow that goes off to your right. Um, there are things that I take out of the definition of science, and they're listed in red. Your carefulness, your, your confidence, uh, peer review, falsification. These are not things that you can decide whether or not some model is science. Whether or not something is science depends on whether or not it makes predictions that, that can be validated, predictions that come true. And the predictions have got to be something um, with some some surprise, some aha factor to it. It's not a prediction like the sun's going to come up tomorrow. It's something a little more surprising than that. <coughs> so I, I'm going to use these terms uh, and collect them together 
and create a definition for science. And what I come up with is that anything that follows the scientific method is science. And the scientific method is a debatable topic. Um, you'll see a little bit more on that on a chart that's coming up. But the four things which provide the scale of how you judge the quality level of science, the things of conjecture, hypothesis, theory, and law on the bottom box, are, are defined in terms of the scientific method. Where, where you have come to, what, what point you're at in, uh, in the method itself. These are all ordinary terms. Almost none of them are available to be found uh, in scientific literature. They're used every day, though, in, in the practice. Put that mouse on the main screen. There you go. Thank you. The first word that gives us some difficulty is the, is the idea of a model. And this is an arrangement, a conceptual arrangement of things that you find in nature and things that are measurable. When you think of a model, very often you think of a thing like a tinker toy a model of, a, of an atom, something like that. That's not the kind of model I'm talking about. This is a model like gravity, and I'm going to talk about that on the next chart. Uh, The, I, I mentioned the Tinker Toy, that's not the kind of model I'm talking about. The model I'm talking about is more like the Bohr atom, the Schrodinger wave equation, uh, a quantum mechanical uh, model for uh, microscopic uh, subatomic particles. Those are the models that I'm talking about. It's not a scale model, and it's not a prototype, it's not a mock-up, it's a conceptual arrangement. Um, the periodic table is an example of a particular kind of model that, that shows relationships between things that are found in nature. The other kinds of models have one characteristic in common. They all have a predictor. Of some, they make some kind of a prediction that can be tested. I write in here, your concept of your mother-in-law is your mental model, and your mother-in-law herself is another model altogether. <laughs> Your concept of a superior supports team is a model. The accumulation of your experience uh, becomes the, the crucible, I call it, for generalization, where you create a model based on all your experience. It's a process of induction. It's not like induction in mathematics, because induction in mathematics, you go to infinity. In your mental model of things, it's just what you've accumulated and sorted out into support your model. And from that, you then deduce something like, that's a lion and it's time to run. That's a deduction that comes out of your inductive, the created model. These models are the containers of science. Everything that is in science is contained in some kind of a model. Um, the idea of gravity is, I found especially interesting, and I, I compare it to the eye, because there's a, a very popular move uh, in the country to bring uh, creation science into the science classroom. And there's a, there's a similarity in, uh, in understanding in, in the forces that go on. Gravity uh, is uh, a phenomenon that we can measure, but we can't see. It's invisible. And if there is a thing, a creator, that has created the eye, we can't see that either. And the question then is, why is creation science not science, but, the, but gravity is science, when we can't see, or neither force is tangible to us. Um, I mentioned here uh, the Kabbalah. I'm not personally familiar with that. It was written about a, uh, around the year 1000, but Newton referred to it in his work on gravity. And it had a collection of, of uh, scientific concepts. They weren't called science even back then. But they went back to the 10th century BC. And at that time, all science was known in the Kabbalah or not at all. 
and it was all the work of God. But that has, that has degenerated until today, if creation science became science in the classroom, was accepted as a scientific precept, it would be the first model existing today in science in which there's a supernatural force. Any, any kind of supernatural force or power or being. Right now, none of those are left in the science. Aristotle had a different model for gravity. And his model was that the bigger an object was, the faster it would fall. And that bothered a lot of people, even back in the fourth century BC. It wasn't until the fifth and sixth century when uh, uh, Philip Philoponus, I guess that would be pronounced, uh, actually made some measurements and said, gee, it's not true. It's not true. Things fall at the same rate regardless of their weight if taking away wind resistance. So you put them in the same kind of container and the weight doesn't matter on how fast things fall. So that was known in the sixth century. Uh, Galileo gets uh, cre credit for most of it in uh, today's literature, in the modern literature. And that was because he took it into in a more scientific domain than Philoponus. Newton gave us a different formulation for gravity, and he created these concepts of mass, momentum, uh, force, force at a distance, um, the product of masses, uh, the inverse square of, uh, of distance affecting gravity. Uh, so a lot of these things were known by uh, Galileo, especially the uh, inverse distance squared, but it was uh, Newton who created the concept of mass, momentum, and force. And uh, that, that was quite a, quite a change. It was, uh, those things are common to us today, uh, but they, they were unknown before Newton. So he created those. And now today, gravity has gotten to the point where in Einstein's general theory of relativity, it's, gravity is considered to be the effect of the distortion of space by large masses. Space is curved, and when an object passes near the, the curvature caused by a large object, its path is distorted. That distortion is called gravity. So gravity has had, had several major models over its history. But still, we still don't have a good idea of what it is. Still a lot of mystery to it. <clears throat> I'm getting into a little bit of a different subject that came up the last time we had this meeting and had the, the first preliminary uh, science, uh, exercise science seminar. And the question came up about, about falsification. I wonder if anybody here is familiar with falsification in science. Have you heard about that? One? Just, just one. Any of you heard of Popper? Carl Emanuel Popper, a philosopher. Uh, he's called a science philosopher. He's the guy that brought it in. Well, uh, there were a few more people uh, interested in this subject last time, but uh, uh, Popper said that every scientific model uh, must have built within it a falsification clause. There must be some way within the model to, to test for its, its validity by showing that something would be false if it weren't for the model. Um, I have not included that in the model of science. And the reason I haven't is I think that Popper made a mistake. And he made a mistake on what science is. I want to talk to you a little bit about the form of science. In sci science is different from logic, though it, it has some similarities in its structure. In science, we have a, a hypothesis, we have a, a sentence which consists of a, I'm sorry, in logic, we have a structure in which we have a sentence with a hypothesis and a conclusion. And that is the form that looks very similar to the structure of science. It, in science, we have an experimental setup, and if you have this experimental setup, it predicts that something's going to happen under those conditions. But that's a little bit different in structure than, than, the, uh, than a logical argument. Uh,
elementary uh, symbolic logic just deals with these sentences and their negations and the concepts of and and or. And you can only go so far with that kind of a st structure and logic and then you get into these quantifiers <coughs> and these quantifiers say there exists a, a, a dog with three legs. There exists a white crow. It's an example that I'm going to use. We have other sentences of the type uh, all crows are black is an example I'm going to use. Um, that's a sentence with a universal quantifier. It says for all objects, if they're a crow, then that object is black. And that's universally quantified. There are three such rules in, in, um, in logical argument called quantifier rules. One is universal in instantiation. That says if all crows are black and you have a crow, then that crow is black. And that's an instance of the universal statement that all crows are black. Existential generation is the thing, gee, I have a bird here and it's black and it's a crow. Then you can say, there exists a bird which is a black crow. That's an existential instantiation. <clears throat> the existential instantiation is, is uh, I'm sorry, I was giving you the existential instantiation. If I have a crow and it's black, then I can say there exists a crow which is black. And that's existential instantiation. If I can see all the crows in the world and I say they're all black, then we have the... Uh, I'm not doing this right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I've lost my train here on the uh, existential generalization. I'm going to come back to that if I can. In, in the scientific model, I mentioned on, at the time of the last slide that we have an experimental setup, which is the cause, and we predict an effect that's going to happen. And all of our models have that essence of the cause and effect except for the model which is like the periodic table, which is just an arrangement of things we see in nature. Okay. This is very similar to the sentence in logic. I mentioned on that chart the, the concept of discriminant analysis. And I made up a chart here in which we have some imaginary data. We collect some data points and we fit a straight line to it. And now we have a model that says, well, the data sort of follows that pattern. And that's an example of model building based on the data. In discriminant analysis, though, so we look a little further and we see that if we, uh, getting a little delay there, one step. I find that the, the data from one source, which I color red, is clumped at one end of the distribution, and the data from the other set is kind of separated from it. In fact, it can be separated by an equation. And I use the straight line. Any straight line between those two straight lines will separate the data from one to the other. And that's called discriminant analysis. And from this, we build models which fit the two separate structures and we then look at the differences between the models of the two. What Popper said was that all scientific models are of the form all crows are black. And in fact, there's a fellow, Hempel, which appears on the next chart, who said that that was an example of, of what uh, um, Popper was saying. Popper said that you cannot determine scientifically that all crows are black just by looking at crow after crow after crow. And that's correct. And no scientist would do such a thing. Popper's statement has that symbolic notation up there which says, for all x, 
you can read it, you can read the different ways it can be translated, I think. No, I guess I don't have them this time. The first, the first sentence can be read for all x. x has the property f implies that x has a property g. And that can be read, everything that's a member of f is also a member of g. It also can be read as all crows are black, where black is a property of the crows. Popper said, in order to prove that that's true, you must set up a condition where the first part is true. You have a crow. And the second part, you have to prove that it cannot be white, for example. That it must be black. And that has the form of the second equation. But I contend that no scientific model is of that form, all crows are black. But this was Popper's falsification. And when you read up on science, you'll find that a lot of people say that one of the conditions of science is that you have a falsification proposition to prove what he's saying here. Yes? If, uh, it seems like just because it's mathematically like it works out, that's not always going to be the case because you would have to know that all crows are black. You would have to be able to know for a fact that you're looking at all the crows. So it, is he just kind of exactly. from the repeatable observable side of things where you just test it and test it? Yes, right. So we don't do what Popper said. And what you say is exactly right. You're getting ahead of me. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this and get down here. Here I use the word ravens instead of crows. If you look it up in the dictionary, uh, a crow or a raven is a certain kind of songbird, like some beautiful song, you know, they squawk. But it's a songbird um, with a black lustrous coat and one of a certain, certain size. So by definition, a crow has to be black. If you took a bird to an uh, ornithologist and asked, you take a white bird to an ornithologist and you'd say, is this a crow? And he'd say, no, it has to be black. So it, it was bound up in the definitions. Popper rejected definitions. He said, definitions are no part of science. And I'm taking a different approach. I'm saying science is based on definitions right at the core. Uh, if, if an ornithologist had to uh, decide whether this bird could be a crow by some other criteria, he'd have to bring in some other standard for what a crow is. He'd have to know something about its DNA or know something about this particular bird's parentage. And if, uh, if two things known to be crows produce this white bird, well, then it, I suppose it could be a crow under some definition. The point of all this is that uh, Falsification is considered to be part of science in a lot of things that you're going to read about if you try to follow up on the subject. But I don't include it as part of the scientific model. One of the things, the way I came to this realization is having dealt with scientific models of all sorts of types from all different fields for many, many years. There was never a model developed with a falsification clause in it. I still read a paper once in a while, especially by physicists, where they think that a falsification clause is supposed to be put into the model. But I've never seen one that, where that happens. Instead, the model makes a prediction. And the prediction is what's tested. If the prediction comes true, if it's a significant prediction, you have a, a point of validation. And the model is beginning to be qualified as a higher level thing. Uh, I did that twice, and I shouldn't have done it twice. If you search the literature for a definition of science, you'll almost always find peer review as part of the definition. Peer review and publication in a peer-reviewed journal. These are criteria for science in almost every source that I'm, I'm aware of besides my own. And by the way, all this work is my own. Um, I guarantee that if you, if you use the words as I've defined them, you can hold your own talking with any kind of scientist. And he's, he's probably not going to ever think to argue with them. You might say, gee, this isn't a hypothesis. It's only a conjecture. He's probably not going to argue with you. He's going to think you know what you're talking about. 
So you can use these terms with a great deal of impunity, but uh, I can't give you a good reference right now uh, outside myself. But I realized early that peer review is not essential to science because uh, Hughes Aircraft Company was kind of a leader in science. Um, there was a famous Assistant Secretary of Defense, assi I'm sorry, Assistant Secretary of the Navy by the name of Willoughby. Uh, he was head of, re of reliability for the whole United States Navy. And he said that Hughes Aircraft Company and Texas Instruments were national treasures and they should have been preserved. And uh, it was kind of an honor to be working in such an institution. Um, much of the work that I did, I would say half the work that I did, was done for the federal government in uh, DOD, Department of Defense. And that work was all classified some, some way or another, in part or in total classified. And we could not get peer review. It was not allowed. We had a strict need to know. We didn't share what we had with anybody, even internal to the company, unless they had a need to know that information. And yet, part of my job was to carve out work that we did and share it with universities. And, and uh, universities couldn't keep up with us. We would do science at uh, typically three times the pace of, of academics. So we would do it in, we used to divide our time span up into three year segments. We would do in one three year segment what it would take in, uh, academic world to do in three three year segments. So we were really outpace them. And one of the reasons we could go faster is we didn't have to go through peer review. But we, we had a different criteria. We'd make a prediction and we'd go out and test it. And if it worked, then we were knew we were on the right track. So in industry, where much more science is done than is ever done in the uh, academic world, uh, peer review is rare. It's a rare phenomenon. You might have a little internal review group but beyond that, it's pretty rare. On the other hand, there are groups that have peer review, and I've listed some on the screen, starting with astrology. You can pick up a journal, and it appears to have peer review. They go through all of the motions of peer review, and yet it's certainly not a science. Creationism, economics, stock market analysis, parapsychology, these things have journals, they have peers, and they're reviewed, and it doesn't elevate them to, to science at all. So there's science that doesn't require peer review, and there's places where there's peer review that's not science, so I leave it out. It's important to science, especially in academic science, because it's a quality control. You see whether you've done all the right things. But when you get all finished, you say, here, I've got a model, you can't tell whether it's been through peer review or not. It's not attached to the model itself, like gravity. You, know, you have a model for gravity. Does it work? That's what counts. I found in putting this t together over the years that the, the difference between basic science and technology was just one, one thing with a couple different aspects. Basic science, you're dealing with things that are found in nature. In technology, you're dealing with man-made objects. In science, you make a prediction based on a model. If the prediction comes true, you have a point of validation. You get enough validation, you begin to, to elevate the model to a higher degree of, uh, of confidence. On technology side, you build a model for a device if the model doesn't work, you can fix the device. So you can make the device look like the model and you can make the model look like the device. So when we build a radar or a guided missile, we keep changing them both until they come into agreement. We call that closure. So closure and validation are the two parallels between closure for technology and validation for basic science. But otherwise, they're both following the scientific method. <coughs> so I'm going to lay it out here for you. One of the criteria of, of science, I say that science is a branch of knowledge. It's not a collection of smelly laboratories and people in white coats and, and experimental stuff. It's, it's not the emergency hospital and it's, it's not a laboratory. 
it's a branch of knowledge. And our knowledge is contained in these models. And it's a branch of knowledge which is objective, meaning that things can be measured. So if you have a field which is typically not uh, science, and the one I like particularly is economics, some parts of economics are measurable. That part of economics can be subjected to science and be treated like science. So you can have science within a field that might not be considered scientific but in its totality. But the part that's objective, the part that can be measured, we can apply science and scientific method to it. One of the criteria of science is that it be shareable. And you can share it in a couple of ways. Um, I could have a black box here, and it, maybe it predicts earthquakes. I'm not going to tell you what's in the black box, but we can run some experiments with the black box. And you say, my golly, that does predict earthquakes. It told me there was going to be a 6.2 in Malaysia tonight, and there was. If that happens enough times, you begin to, to get confidence. And we communicate about the objective results of the model, even though we're not sharing the model. So you have to be able to share it somehow. You can't have a private science. That's, that's probably insanity. Yes? You said that a model, you said does it work and that's what counts. Are these things that you're going through now, how you can clarify whether or not the model works, if it's like objective and, and repeatable and shareable? Is yes. That what, is that what defines if Yes, the it does. Works? And it's coming right up. Okay. So prediction is a, what I call an unmaterialized effect. It's hard to find exactly the right word for it. There's a word that's kind of rare. It's called retrodiction, which is predicting backwards. You're going to say, you're going to predict about something that happened in the past. You haven't discovered it yet. The thing that I like uh, that typifies that is saying that you have a shard, uh, a piece of pottery, and you find it in a particular layer uh, of uh, an archaeological dig, and now you predict, well, if that shard is in that layer, then it ought to have this carbon dig. That's a prediction. If that prediction comes true, then you have a, a point of validation. You can say, gee, that prediction worked here, worked once, let's try it a few more times. Got a few other examples there, and don't have time to go into all of those. But a prediction has to be better than chance. Better than chance. You, it's not a coin toss. It might be statistical. You know, you got a 50-50 chance, that's a coin toss. If you say that the probability of rain this afternoon is 70%, now you're getting something that's a little bit different than chance. 97%, that's a lot different than chance. So a prediction is supposed to be better than chance, and, and it can be tested by experiment. One of the words that's not defined is fact. And so for my talk, a fact is a measurement that can be compared to a standard. The standard can be a ruler, it can be a count, uh, it can be a weight and measure that's uh, held somewhere in a, some secret vault. But a fact is a measurement compared to a standard. Theory is one of the more difficult words. It's part of my ultimate ruler for you because I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use the, uh, the four categories. Uh, theory is my, is my third category. And, uh, and theory is, is used in the, in the public domain so much, and even scientists use the word theory in talking of, uh, amongst themselves, and they mean it two different ways. In science, a theory is a, is a very powerful concept. Theory of evolution is one, and theory of evolution is one of those in the popular media that gets a lot of criticism. In the popular media, you hear the word that it's only a theory. But something that has advanced to a theory has come a long way in the scientific world. But a scientist will talk to another scientist and say, oh, well, you're just theorizing, theorizing about that. And they know what he means is just a conjecture. 
So theory has a strong and a narrow meaning in science, and it's a hypothesis in which a non-trivial prediction has been validated. Okay? I spoke to you earlier about this, getting a little ahead of my story, that science is, is, is not about the discovery of natural laws. And the way we know that's true is that the natural laws don't exist in nature. You can't find them. You, you don't have any of the makings of coordinate systems, weights, measures, uh, values. None of those things exist in nature. They're all created by man. We sense the real world by our natural senses and by instruments. A little diagram of those. Looks like another eye check. Eye check. There are some things we don't sense. And I have those going to the side of, of this diagram. Uh, we humans don't detect cosmic rays uh, or x-rays. Uh, even some colors of light we don't detect. We build instruments to detect them for us, but they bypass our senses. So we're going to build models based on our senses and what our instruments can tell us, and not about other things about which we might speculate. And there are lots of those out there today. So I've already discussed this, that science uh, so I didn't mention that science represents reality. It represents those things that we can measure. We can subject to measurement, reduce to a fact. And we build our models based on those facts, and we predict something, and we collect other new facts to see whether or not uh, the model is able to predict. The ultimate power in science is its ability to make valid predictions. This is too many words on this chart. <laughs> and that's redundant. The subjective are the things that reside in our brain. And you'll often see uh, in the definitions of science that it's to explain or describe. But whether or not it explains something or describes something requires a receiver, another human brain, to decide, did that explain it to me? Does that describe it to me? And that makes it subjective. So I leave out of my definition of science anything that is subjective, including to explain or describe. Also the idea that you have a belief in something. And you see this all, all the time. Most scientists believe that carbon dioxide is, uh, is causing the climate to warm. That's a belief, but it's not science. <coughs> to be objective, one way to make it objective is that it be shared or shareable. So it's not just confined to one brain. It's measurable, it's got to be reduced to facts. And it has to be able to make a prediction. If you do all those things, you have an objective model. So a little summary of all this stuff so far. Science is a branch of knowledge. It's the objective branch of knowledge. It is shared, ultimately. Maybe at first you keep it secret so you can sell all these black boxes, but later on it's going to get shared. People are going to tear the black box open and see whether or not it was a sham. One of the criteria of a model is that it must meet all of the facts in its domain. So the one that I've been working on uh, mostly lately is uh, on climate. We have a great deal of data about climate that goes back millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. The models that are being used to predict global warming do not reproduce those effects of the past. So they don't fit all of the uh, facts that are in the domain. And what scientists need to do to fix that is find an objective way 
to separate where the model does apply from where the model doesn't apply. And you've got to do that on some basis other than just saying, well, it starts in 1750. You need, a, you need an objective way to say that uh, when the power radiated from the sun is at a certain level, then this model applies. We're getting close to the Q&A time. I got quite a few more charts to go. Let's see if I can pick, cherry pick some of the best things. I listed for myself the elements of science, things that have to go into science. <coughs> Definitions, observations and measurements, models, building a model that makes predictions which lead to experiments and validation. Okay? And I organized those into four uh, categories. Um, and I, 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 this was in, in part to fit the words that we already know and already use. We have science is based on the foundations of language. And embedded in language is logic and, and mathematics. They come right out of language. The second part is discovery. Uh, in Orange County, we had the Discovery Museum. It was supposed to be a museum of science and it was all about discovery. Well, discovery is an important part. Discovery is the observing and the measuring, the reduce, reduction to facts and the extraction of patterns from the facts. The next step for the science is creating a model that combines those facts into a way that it can make a prediction that can be tested. And then the validation is the making of those tests. So what I created for the scientific method were those four categories, foundations, discovery, creativity, and validation, four separate steps. They look like that all together by themselves. I hit it twice. Hang on. In science, the great brunt of all the material that goes into a model is laid out in the, uh, in the foundations, in all the language, and then a smaller part of the facts that are going to a particular model, and then from that, it's condensed into a, one or two models, and those are tested to create laws. I made a model like this for CrossFit, because I contend that CrossFit, as it's proceeding, is a science. It has foundations, it has discovery, it has creativity, and it has validation. It has all the elements of the scientific method. So a conjecture, for, first, uh, uh, something that's not science is something that, that lacks in definitions. If it lacks in definitions, it fails as a science right at the start, right out of the gate. A conjecture has definitions and it has some kind of a cause and effect model, but it may not fit all of the data that's out there. A hypothesis fits all of the data in its domain. It, it's composed of uh, observations and facts and it produces a model that makes a, an unusual prediction. Of, and so what it adds to a conjecture is that it fits all of the data in the domain. That raises a conjecture into a hypothesis. A hypothesis becomes a theory when some of those key, or at least one of the key predictions has been validated. Now we have a theory. A law occurs when every prediction that we can make out of this model has been subjected to the same, to the same rigor. So you can see what, what a law adds to a theory, what a theory adds to a hypothesis, what a hypothesis adds to a conjecture. Two branches of science I already discussed. I want to throw this open to questions. Um, I'm not going to have time. I have a glossary at the end of this, and I have a set of axioms of science which we could talk about if we had more time, and the rest is all back up. So uh, please entertain some ideas, some questions. Yes? So um, can you go back to the model writing concept chart? Please. One with all the color? Yes, that one. So the conjecture hypothesis theory and law are just different levels of what a model is. 
Like, yes, they're, okay. qual they're quality indicators for a model. Okay. Okay. If some guy's got a story for you and he says it's science, and you say, but have you, where does it work? Where does it fit? Have you considered these particular things in your model? If he hasn't, he's working in a conjecture. A conjecture is the weakest form of model, but it's still science. It's still science. We deal with conjectures all the time. We're at the fringes of science today. We have the limitations on uh, quantum mechanics. At the finest level, quantum mechanics is at odds with the laws of thermodynamics. And that's a problem. So it doesn't, it doesn't fit everything. So quantum dynamics is still a conjecture, but it's powerful. It made some predictions, and some of those predictions are working out. So it's moving from conjecture to hypothesis to theory, but it still doesn't fit everything. At, at the other extreme of uh, physics, we have the problem with the relativity and, and uh, the Big Bang. We make no measurements ever of anything that's infinite or infinitesimal. Yet the, uh, the uh, cosmological theory, it's called the standard cosmological theory, uh, has uh, black holes and the Big Bang that come out of things that are infinite. We've never measured anything like that. And we have math all the time. Math has infinities. There's no problem with that in mathematics. It never happens in nature. Not yet. We can't measure that yet. So there's a problem. That's at the fringe of knowledge. That's as much as we know about cosmology. And it gets into places where it doesn't fit everywhere. It happens in uh, climatology. It happens in physiology. It happens everywhere. There are limits to what we know so far. You need to be able to judge what, where you are in this process of a particular model, a model for a cell. How much do we know? How much has been tested? How much has been validated? Okay. So make those kinds of, of skeptical judgments. More? So is cosmic theory? No. Yeah, I would I would give it a I would give it a plus as a, as a theory. Uh, I think we have enough validation from uh, from experiments that uh, people who are in the CrossFit program are outperforming the people who are in other uh, general physical uh, programs. What are they called? GPT. Yeah. What are your personal opinions on the, the level of failure that something will? Have. I mean, like the whole string theory thing, you know, there's success on one end and success on the other, but there's no, yes. there's no room for error at all. But. Yes. Um, well, string theory is definitely a conjecture. And I've seen papers written by people, that, very encouraging papers to me, and from my top level view, where they say it doesn't deserve the name theory. It's not yet a theory because it hasn't been validated. But there, it's a struggle with uh, some of the patterns that we see in the in the cosmos that just can't be explained without, without something. The standard general relativity doesn't account for what we see. So the string theory is a way to try to make some sense out of it. Definitely a conjecture. But even just saying, like, scientists like, are always wanting to just throw out, you know, if it's this proof, they crush it and it's gone. But if someone crush it and we've all, you know, there's someone out there that says, oh, it doesn't work for me. Well, you're the, you know, you're the 1%, you suck. <laughs> but it works for everybody else, so we don't throw it out, we keep it. Yeah. Like, what's acceptable? What do you think is acceptable? Um, I, I didn't get into the statistics of this at all, but this is all statistical. Uh, I use an analogy of a weather prediction. You know, it's not always going to come true. And, and you make your statement very carefully in science. You say that um, we expect some kind of a distribution of success. There are going to be some failures, some extreme successes, you know. So you predict the whole shape of, the, of a probability curve, and that's part of your model. And we're, we're still working on that for CrossFit. Yes? Well, when you talk about something like that, that you, know, you have this distribution curve, a lot of that has to do with how well things adhere to the definitions, doesn't it? I mean, if you have something that's got ethereal definitions or not really hard set definitions, intensity, you know, right. repetition, et cetera, range of motion, 
suddenly that starts making the whole thing a bit gray. Yes, how well did you actually do those exercises? Yeah. You know, it, it could become subjective if you're not careful. But you need ways to measure and, and you handle it statistically. Yeah. Because predictability is the thing we're looking for. Do you have a litmus test, a p-value litmus test, for when theory is predictable enough to become law? Can you really use it to say, yes, this is, you know, what, what p-value are you looking for? The, the law, getting to a law is very difficult to do. You have to think of all the possible consequences of, uh, of the model that you have. Someone might throw up to, uh, to CrossFit, what does it do to your longevity? And it's going to take a long time before we know whether that's positive or negative for longevity. Or even if you have less longevity, maybe you enjoy it more. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think the other thing I think is interesting is that even though something becomes a law, it, it, it's just tested within the scope of our own knowledge and how much we understand that subject. A good example would be the law of gravity. Yes. Yeah, there may be aspects of gravity that we don't fully understand, and we know that there are. But it's still a law within what we tested. Exactly right. Uh, Newton's laws are still laws. Uh, we have restricted the domain by saying that the that the masses involved or the speeds involved are below some relativistic limits. So now you restrict the domain, and the and the model still works. So that's part of what science is about: is bringing the model in so it fits in some objective way uh, your reality. This uh, lecture is condensed down from uh, a lecture that lasted about uh, uh, three quarters of the day and then was Q&A for the rest of the day. I gave it several times at UCI. Got a lot of feedback from, uh, from the professors, mostly in physical sciences department or college and uh, some from engineering. Um, and good generous reviews, good people, but it didn't go anywhere with them because they don't work in any kind of journals where something like this would be published. This probably would be published in the philosophy journal. But the other thing was that some of them were practicing fields where they were quite uncomfortable with this. I said, you mean that all this that I'm working on has just been a conjecture all along? Gee, sorry. You know? but we, we had, uh, I've given this to a lecture, we had uh, two parapsychologists who were part of the, uh, the college there. And uh, it, I was telling them, gee, that isn't even science at all. And so, so there were, there were regions, I was, I was stepping on people's rice bowls. But still, this same group gave me permission to use this in my teacher training classes. And there I had a, a full half day to, to give you the same amount of material. There's a lot more to it, a lot more we could go into, and I'd like to do that with you sometime. Take a short break. Short. Sure.